Grace and peace to you. I am Reverend Cynthia Reyes Fillmore, pastor at Beulah Presbyterian Church. As we worship today, my prayer is that God's word will pierce your heart with its truth. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to worship. We come together today to worship our God with gratitude and joy for all that he has done for us. You will notice in the bulletin there is an offering envelope. As you may be aware of, the worship services here at Beulah are broadcast on the Pittsburgh Faith and Family Channel at no cost to us. And so quarterly, we take a special offering to help support Cornerstone TV so that they can continue this ministry. So this is an opportunity for you to contribute I encourage you to be generous. Please drop them in the offering plate or make sure they get to the church office. And sports camp begins this week, Monday night through Wednesday. We could still use some help. The board for signups is in Fellowship Hall. I encourage you all to stop by and take a look and sign up where you feel your gifts lie. But I know that two areas we are needful of is in golf, we need some golf assistance, and we also need some devotional leaders. Please note that the church office, the church itself, will be closed Friday and Saturday this week in observance of the holiday. And then finally, in the bulletin, you will note that I am calling our church to a season of prayer in the month of July. Each of the Sundays of July, we will meet at 945 in room 209, and we will pray for about an hour for our nation and for our world with the things that have happened in the past weeks, the violence in Charleston, and in so many places around the world, Christians are being horribly persecuted. I believe that our first response is to pray, and so I hope you will join me beginning next week at 9.45. And now, friends, let us take a few moments to silence our hearts as we prepare to worship God. Please rise if you're able and join me in our call to worship. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. My teaching shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the light rain upon the tender plant, as the showers upon the grass. We will proclaim the name of the Lord, and let the glory come to our God. Please remain standing as we sing our hymn of praise.
Loving God, we have gathered to meet you. We have come to listen to you, to seek you, to worship you. You are the beginning of all things, the life of all things. You knew us before we were born. In you we become, in you we live. Loving God, you are here and everywhere, around us and within us. You know our innermost thoughts. In you we hope, in you we live. You are the source of serenity, giving peace that is beyond our understanding. In you we are still, in you we live. Loving God, we live in you, we worship you. Loving God, you live in us, we worship you. Amen, you may be seated. Will you join me now on our prayer of confession? Holy God, we hear your words, trust your promises, and still shy away from acting with boldness, witnessing with confidence, speaking with kindness. We pass by the homeless, avoid the eyes of a street person, shrug our shoulders at another killing. We keep our faith hidden, our prayers personal, and our voices quiet empowering God, fill us with joy in believing and with confidence in living so we may bear your light to those you bring into our lives. Let nothing keep us from waking as faithful followers. While it is true we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Sparing, sent him to die. I 
scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art Sings my song, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my song, my Savior God, to thee. The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, far away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God, they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose count this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. 
Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord. Invite the children to come forward as we sing. Good morning. So I'm not Miss Carolyn. <laughs> Miss Carolyn is on vacation, so I get to spend some time with you today. Pastor Cynthia read us a story about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of God, and he was sent by God to tell the people of Nineveh that they weren't doing what God wanted them to do. At least he was supposed to tell them that, but he ran away instead. I wonder if you guys can help me with something. I want one of you to try to run away and hide from me. You wanna do it, Jordan? All right, there's a catch though. You have to hold on to this ribbon. All right, let's try it. Good job, Jordan. So because of the ribbon, I could still, I could follow Jordan to where he was, right? He wasn't hiding very well, no. Jonah couldn't run away from God's love either. God always knew where Jonah was. God knew Jonah was being disobedient and was sailing away in a boat because he didn't want to deliver the message to Nineveh. God knew that. We can't run away from God's love. It's just not possible. God's love is too big. The creator of the wind and the waves always loves us and always knows where we are, even if we're being disobedient like Jonah. And he will seek us out because he loves us. So let's pray and thank God for his love. Dear God, thank you so much for your great love. Your love is so big, we can never ever run away from it. Please help us to remember that you care about us and watch over us just like Jonah. Amen. All right. Well, let's go out of our sanctuary and go to the knowing place and hear another story of God. Sometimes we all want to run away. We want to escape. Lieutenant Kelly Flynn was the first female bomber pilot, and she was allowed to resign from the Air Force rather than face court martial. She was charged with conduct unbecoming an officer, 
disobeying an order and for making a false statement in which she lied to her superior officer. She had an affair with a civilian married man and she knew the consequences before her actions but when she was charged she preferred to escape, to leave the Air Force rather than face the consequences. At times, as I say, we're all tempted to run away, running away from God, running away from what he wants us to do. And that's exactly what Jonah was doing. Second Kings chapter 14 tells us that Jonah was a prophet during the reign of Jeroboam II in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jonah lived in Galilee, and God called him to go to Nineveh in modern-day Iraq and to preach to the Assyrians. Now, most of the time in Scripture, we see that a prophet was perhaps called to preach against a people, but allowed to remain in his own native country, but not Jonah. Jonah was called to go as a missionary on foreign soil and call the people to repentance. God asking Jonah to go to Nineveh would be like God asking one of us to go to ISIS and speak judgment and salvation to them. When God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, Jonah was horrified. Nineveh? Our nation's worst enemies? And that's exactly what they were. Because the Assyrians were brutal warriors. There, are art that de, that de, there is art that depicts these scenes of the Assyrians decapitating people, impaling heads on stakes and the like. Also, Nineveh was a very rich city. The book of Nahum tells us that there was an endless supply of gold and silver and wealth, plunder from surrounding nations. And with the exception of Babylon, God's people were harmed more by Assyria than any other nation. But Assyria did not do this out of any long-standing hatred against the Israelites. They warred against Israel simply as another nation along the path to the domination of the world. So when Jonah received this call to preach repentance to these people, he was not happy. Later on in the book, he said to God, For I know you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah was afraid that if he went as God commanded and the people repented, God would be merciful to them. That was really at the core of his resistance. He hated the Assyrians. And the last thing he wanted to do was to be an agent of salvation for his worst enemies. He wanted them to be punished for their wickedness. And so Jonah ran away. He went off in the opposite direction from Nineveh on the way to Tarshish. He found a ship and he paid the fare and got as far away from God as possible, or so he thought. Now, logically, we know that trying to run away from God doesn't make any sense. It's an exercise in futility. But we still try to do it in many ways. One of the ways that we try to run away from God is to ignore him and ignore what he has said to us such as the fact that God has asked us to put him first in our lives, to give of our first earnings to him, to give of our time and our talent to him. We also try to run away from God or ignore the fact that God asks us to love one another, to refrain from slander and speaking critically of others, or the fact that God asks us to go to each other, to work out our differences in ways that build unity. Or the fact that God asks us to go and serve in his name. We struggle to remain faithful to what God wants us to do. 
and we're tempted to take the easy way out and run away from our problems, run away from our responsibilities to God. The story of Jonah teaches us that running will get you nowhere. You can try to run away from God, but you sure can't hide. Three things. Running away from God is costly. It's embarrassing and can even be painful. And running away from God is ultimately unfulfilling. First of all, running away from God is costly. Instead of obedience, God, uh, Jonah chose to separate himself from God. In the first three verses of the book, we are told that twice he ran away from the presence of the Lord. And your relationship with God will suffer if you are rebellious and disobedient. Sometimes people ask, why does God seem so far away? Well, the first thing to check is, have you been obedient to everything God has asked you to do? And until you do what God has asked you to do, there will not be much peace. And there will not be the same sense of intimacy you had with God. Also, running away is costly at times for other people, not just ourselves. Jonah put the entire ship and its crew in danger. And he ran into a literal, physical storm. When we are disobedient, at times God will send a storm to get our attention. So do you really want to pay the cost of rebellion, the lack of fellowship with God, and the lack of peace? Running away from God is costly. And then secondly, running away from God is embarrassing, and it could even be painful. There was a gentleman who was sitting in on a book discussion group, and at one point, he got so offended by something someone said that he got up, went out the door, and slammed it behind him. Well, to break the tension, one of the participants said, well, he's gone, to which the hostess replied, no, he isn't, that's a closet. It can be embarrassing to try to run away. Now, I'm sure the emotional stress in Jonah's life was staggering. And Jonah was actually embarrassed to admit that he was a prophet of God. The sailors asked him five questions, but he only answered two of them. He never answered the question, what is your occupation? It took considerable pain inflicted upon everyone before Jonah was willing to confess his disobedience and admit that he was the reason these people's lives were in danger. So rebellion against God can be embarrassing and it can be painful. You can't deny the pain that Jonah experienced in being swallowed by a large fish. Now, here is where many people have trouble with the story of Jonah. They dismiss it as a tall tale, the mother of all big fish stories, an allegory, anything but the truth. But yet, the Bible talks about Jonah as an actual historical figure, even Jesus. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was referring, of course, to his death and resurrection. And I wonder if we can accept the fact of the bodily resurrection of Jesus, why do we have a problem with the story of Jonah being swallowed by a large fish? And if a scientific explanation is helpful for you, whole animals as large as a man have been found in the stomachs of the sperm whale, the whale shark, and the white shark. But either way, the lesson in the story of Jonah is that running away from God can not only be embarrassing, but it can also be painful. 
And then finally, running away from God is ultimately going to be unfulfilling. Because God's plans and purposes for Jonah were put on hold because of his rebellion. Think about it this way. You're traveling along on a highway toward your destination. But you decide to take an exit and go off over here somewhere. And as long as you meander around, you will never be able to reach your destination. So God sent a storm to get Jonah's attention. And we get storms in our lives also, ways that God gets our attention. How long does a storm last? Well, how long does it take for God to get your attention? God sent a storm which was perfectly suitable for Jonah's need for spiritual maturity. And it can happen that way for us as well. So remember, running from God is ultimately unfulfilling because your life purposes will be put on hold. Jonah learned that the farther he ran, the more painful coming back would be. Jonah ran and he thought he could hide, but God sent a storm and a fish to get his attention. Out of love, God would not let Jonah go. And when Christina had uh, Jordan run down the aisle with that red ribbon, I thought that red ribbon is God's tether, always with us always wanting to draw us back to himself. You can run from God, but you can't hide. Late one night, on an abandoned stretch of interstate highway, a woman was driving alone, and she noticed a semi in her rearview mirror. He was barreling toward her with his blinker on, and as he pulled to the side of her window, she heard the whoosh of the air brakes, and suddenly he pulled back behind her with his huge lights blinding into the car. She pressed down on the accelerator to get away from the truck, and her anxiety and fear heightened because the truck drove right up behind her and kept right on her bumper. So she panicked, and she slammed down the accelerator to try to get away from the truck. She desperately began to search for an exit. And finally she saw one and she flew off the ramp and screeched into a gasoline station. And she jumped out of her car and ran into the station screaming for help. Well, the trucker, of course, followed her. He stopped, he jumped out of his cab, and he ran towards the woman. But when he got to her car, he stopped. And he threw open the back door and he pulled out a man who had been hiding behind her seat. Sometime in the night, an unknown assailant had slipped into this woman's car and was just waiting for an opportunity to attack her. And from his high vantage point, that trucker saw the man hiding. For this woman, the one that she feared and was running from, was the one who could save her life. The lesson in the book of Jonah is that when we try to run from God, things do not go well. And it's a lesson that each and every one of us needs to hear. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in Jewish synagogues, when the story of Jonah is read, the people in the congregation respond with the words, we are Jonah. Because the book of Jonah is about us. It's like a mirror, which means at times we will not like what we see. Because we are like Jonah, in that at times we try to run away from God and what he wants us to do. At times we're disobedient, at times, we're filled with hatred, and we don't care about others. And at times, we just simply cannot trust God. But also, friends, just like the story of Jonah, out of love, God will never let us go. 
Amen. You may be seated. Three of the best things that we can say to somebody are, I love you, I forgive you, I'll pray for you. Before we pray this morning, I'd like you just to look around the sanctuary a bit. Just look around. You're going to see family. You're going to see friends. You're going to see folks that you know as church friends. Perhaps you're going to see strangers. What I'd like you to do this morning is pick somebody that you've seen. In our time of prayer, I want you to pray for that person. And afterwards, if you feel led, to go up and tell them, I prayed for you today. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. Let the Holy Spirit work. I had it easy because Dennis, uh, Missouri, walked up and he said, I'm going to have a knee operation done. And I thought, I'm going to pray for Dennis today. Then I saw a family ah, that I dearly love. And uh, I'll pray for them as well. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, this week we remember our prayer families, Gloria Fulton, Michael and Artis Smith, Dorothy Jones. We pray for that special person or persons that you laid on our hearts just a moment ago. We pray that that person will know your love 
and perhaps know somebody new for the first time. We pray for those families this week, Lost Lord, loved ones. For the family of Dave Kinsel, whose memorial service was yesterday. We pray for those that are sick at home or in a hospital. We continue to pray for persecuted Christians around the world, those who suffer unbelievable hardship, terror, and death for proclaiming Jesus as Lord. We pray for grieving people in Charleston that they may continue to come together through God's love and in the power of the Holy Spirit be united and reunited with each other. Lord, hear our prayers. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray, to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love through that same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, you have called us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Keep us one in faith and service, breaking bread together and proclaiming the good news to the world that all may believe you are love, turn to your ways, and live in the light of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send peace on earth and put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation against nation and race against race. O oh God, whom we cannot love unless we love our neighbors, Remove hate and prejudice from us and all people so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or threaten and live together in your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Thine is the kingdom and 
and the power and the glory forever. As we have been blessed by a loving God, let us now return back to him a portion of what he has blessed us with, our tithes, our offerings, our gifts. Loving God, you have indeed blessed us with so much. Please fill our hearts with your love so overflowing that we may give out of joy and gratitude always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
If you would like prayer before you leave today, please know that Elder Bill Ritter will be in the prayer room following the worship service. And now, friends, I charge you to go with the knowledge that God equips you and empowers you for every good work. And that not only does he walk with you all the days of your life, but he loves you with an endless love. So be blessed as you go, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God with your worship. Go now in the power and strength of God's own Holy Spirit to love as you have been loved. Thanking you, thanking you, Jesus. 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 Asanti. Asanti Yesu. Asanti. Asanti Yesu. Asanti. Asanti Yesu. Asanti. Asanti Yesu. Shukuru. Shukuru Yesu. Shukuru. Shukuru Yesu. Shukuru. Shukuri Yesu, Shukuru, Shukuri Yesu. These are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the ones in the desert, crying. Prepare the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's here of Jubilee, and out of Zion's still salvation comes. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide in the world. And we are the laborers in your Declaring the word of the Lord, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of time still salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 